Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. Alex Wolf here breaking down the Knicks 116 to 100 loss to the Hawks. The wheels finally came off for this shorthanded team after that gutty win against Cleveland the other day. And yet one big question came out of this. Why isn't Precious Achua playing more? I'll get into that and more next on Locked On Knicks. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right. Welcome in to Locked On Knicks. And I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Knicks first listen today and every day, whether you're checking us out on your favorite podcast platform or taking in the sights and sounds on YouTube. We appreciate you making us a part of your daily routine. Make sure you hit that auto download function on your favorite podcast app or the notification bell on YouTube so you never miss an episode. That is, of course, after you hit the subscribe button in both places, because we are here for you guys five days a week, if not more, and you never want to miss an episode. I'm Alex Wolf. I'm editor-in-chief of Knicks site, The Strickland, which you can find at the Strickland.land. And your New York Knicks lose to the Atlanta Hawks. It was it was a valiant fake comeback. They went down by over 20 points in the first half, came all the way back to tie the game, and yet then the I think just fatigue set in. The fact that they were having a poor shooting night overall set in, you know, there's only so long that you can, that you could just kind of buoy a bad offensive night with good defense, particularly when you're shorthanded and there's only so many uh, warm bodies to throw out there. So I think the Knicks just sort of ran out of juice down the stretch. Uh, but look, first off reminder, this is, this is the most likely outcome. Even when you're playing a, a team that themselves was down, you know, their superstar and Trey young, this, you know, having a uh ultimately where you're losing a game where you're down three out of five starters and your three most important starters in Brunson, Ananobi, and Randall, plus of course Mitchell Robinson, who's still out. I mean, this is this is the most likely outcome when you're down that many of your best players. Uh so you know it is what it is, I guess. Uh I'll before I get into all the Knicks stuff, I just got to shout out Jalen Johnson too on the Hawks. Like it kind of sucks to admit but the hawks have a freaking stud in that dude he they've developed in the right way they brought him along slowly after they took him uh later in the first round a few years ago i mean i think he's gonna be a force for a really long time he had 26 points nine rebounds seven assists and that's only like slightly out of the realm of possibility of what he's doing normally because i was uh, lucky enough to make a, a good fantasy pickup of him <laughs> earlier this year so i see the stat lines he's putting up on a daily basis so First off, shout out to him. I, th- I thought he had a really good game um, for the Hawks in this one. But for the Knicks, I thought it was just, you know, it was another night of like warrior performances, right? You know, from these shorthanded Knicks, like it was an awful shooting night. You know, there's there's no getting around that. They shot uh, 16 of 52 from three, which is 30.8%. I mean, I guess all things considered shooting that high, high of volume, it's not the worst thing in the world, but they're overall shooting left a lot to be desired 38 and 99 overall which is only 38.4 percent you're not going to win too many games when you're shooting that poorly from the field uh it's just it's not sustainable um and i'm quite frankly surprised that the knicks were able to make the comeback that they did considering just the like the hole that they started in but again that was all thanks to their you know just kind of their grit and and toughness and you know ability to crank up the defense when they really want to and never say die and all that good stuff. All those, you know, Tibbs things that we talk about, but yeah, I mean, I, I I thought that they did pretty well, all things considered. I mean, they did tie the game at 76, 76. I think that was the only time that they drew even for the rest of the game. If I'm not mistaken, I mean, things kept pretty tight until the last few minutes when, you know, the, the rope kind of slipped and then they end up of course losing by 16, but I don't know. It wasn't really emblematic of where things were for most of the second half. Like the Knicks were, you know, they managed to, they got down by 20 in the first quarter um, or maybe it was early second quarter, but either way they, you know, really came out of the gate, not looking great. Uh, And they were down over 20 points and then managed to start chipping away by halftime and they were down, I think, only by 11 by half after chipping the deficit down to as little as 10 um, before the half. And then come out in the third quarter, had a really, really good third quarter, managed to come all the way back, tie the game, and then just weren't quite able to get over the hump. And, 
you know, get to the other side of, of the comeback there. And then of course, just kind of fell apart down the stretch. But part of what made that kind of confusing was that precious Achua barely saw the floor in the fourth quarter, which was, which was bizarre considering the game that he put forward. He ended up with 15 points, six rebounds, two assists, a steal and a block in only 23 minutes and 43 seconds, which is, I mean, compared to what he was putting up and compared to what other players on this team are putting up right now, I mean, that's like nothing. I, I, I'm really confused as to why he was playing so little and why he's played so little for the last three games after playing so well and, you know, seeming to establish himself as like this crazy four or five combo player or whatever. Um, he barely touched the floor in the fourth quarter, didn't come in until the game was basically already at hand, uh, you know, and, and already – you know, lost for the Knicks and won for the Hawks uh, with about two minutes left. And I, I don't know, it seemed like other players on the team were starting to sort of lose their gas a bit and yet Precious didn't get unglued from the bench. It was just kind of bizarre. Um, and again, it's the third straight game where he's playing a low minutes load like this. So like, it does make me wonder a little bit, is he suffering from some undisclosed injury right now? Are they trying to trying to protect him in some way in that regard of trying to, you know, not put too much stress on him because he's got, I don't know, like a strain or something that we haven't heard about. Like that's one thing that came to mind. Did he somehow fall out of favor with Tibbs, which seems even less likely because it seemed like Tibbs is in love with this guy in the last month or so. Um, but I don't know. Tibbs, Tibbs has his ways, I guess. So it's entirely possible that that happened, but I not likely, I don't think, but yeah, I don't know. It just it's bizarre that he's he's not playing as much these last few games. And, you know, the last game, it sort of made sense. The Knicks were closing strong. But this game, the Knicks clearly needed a shot in the arm down the stretch. And Precious was that for the minutes that he played. I mean, he just feasted on blow by dunks in this game. I mean, he was he was getting them constantly. That was pretty much all he all he did was blow by dunks, blow by layups and just like out hustle, out muscle kind of plays on the inside like he was just for as good of a game as I just gave Jalen Johnson props for, like uh, Precious really was working him. I mean, he was taking him off the dribble from the perimeter, getting inside on him, you know, and, and completely blowing by him at times. He was also just taking him from the perimeter and just backing him down, had a couple baskets like that, had a number of them where he just kind of drove into the teeth of the D and, uh, you know, managed to absorb contact and get a layup. Like, I don't know if it was ultimately that Tibbs was looking at things and saying, well, we're sort of behind in this game. We need threes right now. Like threes are what we're good at at this moment. And Precious isn't really shooting threes yet. But, you know, it helps to be able to shoot threes if you have a guy out there that can generate rim pressure. And it especially helps if you have like a guy like they could have put Precious out there in an alignment where he was basically the five and then had a guy who can put the ball on the floor and dribble and, you know, generate pressure that way, get all the way to the rim out of the five spot it seems like it would have been beneficial for this team in this game. You know, they could have kept shooting a bunch of threes and maybe hoped something stuck because, uh, but honestly, you know, the way that they were shooting, they were getting open looks like the Hawks defense did not have a great game in this game. Like the Knicks, if you go back and look at all their attempts from three, like 80% of them, there was no defender within five feet of the shooter. It was just every shooter went cold on the Knicks in this game. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think it would have been beneficial to still have Precious out there uh, regardless, you know, because it's it's like, well, if he's able to put the ball on the floor and, and all that stuff, like that's giving you something that's just as useful as whatever Hartenstein or Sims could give you. And he was doing it really well and was scoring efficiently. I just I don't know. It was bizarre to me. I guess we'll see going forward. Like I, maybe this is Tibbs trying to get Precious more ready for the role that he'll play once people are healthy. Like. I, I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense to me because I thought he really could have made a difference in this game and given the Knicks, a you know, sort of a gimme win uh, that they needed when, you know, everybody's injured or whatever. They, they don't have the hardest schedule in the world coming up this week. Uh, so I guess it's ultimately fine. You know, they can figure it out, but they do have a tough West Coast trip coming up that they might need as many wins as they can get now to sort of absorb and, you know, be ready for a tough West Coast trip where they might potentially go like 0 and 4 or like 1 and 3. I think they start with the Blazers. So I, I don't think it's likely that they lose to the Blazers. But, you know, there's a decent chance they could go like 1 and 3 if they're not, if their health isn't improving by then. 
um, if Brunson is still limited, if anything like that. So I don't know. That it would have been helpful to win this game, and I think Precious could have legitimately impacted that. Uh, we also saw the Knicks drop a spot in the standings uh, after this game as well. They're now tied for fourth, but they lose a tiebreaker, so they're technically in the fifth spot right now. Uh, I think their lead to Miami is down to uh, just a half a game at this point. And then uh, the matchup with Orlando coming up is going to be extra important because now essentially that's going to decide uh, who's going to be in that four spot right now. And if Orlando wins, they essentially gain two games on the Knicks, which is is uh, a big deal if, if you're the Knicks, which kind of underscores again why this game was somewhat important. Um, so I just wish they would have done everything that they could have possibly done to win, but I it didn't really with sitting precious. But some guys that you can't fault, I mean, you can't fault any guy on, on this team right now because they've all been playing their hearts out. But Josh Hart had another really solid game. Dante DiVincenzo struggled a bit. Uh, but, you know, kind of soaked up the shots that were needed. Deuce McBride had a pretty solid game again, although there's some things that I want to see from him that I wish that he would do more. Uh, so I've got a bunch more to get into in just a second. But first, I want to let you all know about our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. And I can personally attest, I've bought some parts from my car off eBay Motors and never had a problem yet. And it's mostly been little cosmetic parts or whatever, but it's always good to know that what you're getting off eBay is going to for sure fit. And you can really hunt around for good deals, too. So that's always a good time as well. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, and I'm back in to keep talking through this Knicks loss and Josh Hart. Ends with another solid stat line. I mean, it's just becoming a nightly thing during this injury-plagued time. Uh, 14 points, 8 rebounds, 6 assists. I guess sort somewhat modest for him, uh, given the returns lately. But 5 of 12 shooting, 3 of 7 from 3. Did all that in 43 minutes. I mean, I just I thought it was, it was solid for him. You know, there's not really much more to say about this guy at this point. Um, he's just kind of doing what needs to be done for this team when they're down so many guys and playing the minutes that are needed and you know providing whatever it is this team needs and he's been doing it really well too so his post post all-star break stats now uh come out to seven games 16.1 points per game 11.9 rebounds per game 6.1 assists per game he's shooting 42.7 percent from the field 41.5 percent from three which is the really big thing but also 43.4 minutes per game i mean he's really <laughs> if he thought he was sighing before the uh all-star break when he was making that i think it was before the all-star break when he made that comment about like yeah you know, when they were like oh how do you feel about playing these minutes he's like i wish i could play less but you know people are out so i need to play them um i'm sure he feels even more like that now but props to him i mean he's really doing it for the knicks right now um and i think you know again i've been trying to just kind of focus in on the the positives during this injured stretch and you know what we could be learning about this team and you know what what could be you know beneficial for the rest of the season i guess and i think if there's any positives to draw from this kind of rough stretch and this injured stretch where people are having to extend themselves out a lot further and everything else josh hart finding his three-point shot has to be right up there with the top things because if he's shooting confidently He's a totally different player, and that's been showing through lately. I mean, the three from seven from three in this game, you know, just compounds with the amount of times that he's been, uh, you know, putting up good shooting numbers lately. I think the big thing, and the Knicks should zero in on this, is, you know, especially once he goes back to a bench roll early on, just get him the ball in a good open three early and let him see one go through the hoop. Like, that seems to be the key for him. If one of his first couple attempts goes in, 
he's ready to rock for the rest of the game. But if he has a couple ugly misses or he has to take a couple ugly shots that don't go in from three, then he seems to get in his head and and gets like a little more uh, uh, reluctant to shoot those threes the rest of the game. And so, yeah, I think that's, I think that's kind of what I've been learning throughout this. And also just, I mean, this applies for older players, younger players, whatever. We used to talk about this with Emmanuel Quickly or Obi Toppin or, you know, any of those guys on the team too. But, you know, having a long leash and knowing that, you know, you have security that you're going to be playing a bunch of minutes regardless and that you're kind of needed to eat up those shot attempts and all that stuff goes a long way too. So, I mean, just a heart knowing that he has the green light and everything else is is helpful too. So hopefully that's being conveyed to him. Uh, speaking of green lights, though, we got the forever green light here. Uh, Dante DiVincenzo, 21 points, four rebounds, six assists. Tough, tough shooting game for him. Seven to 24 overall. Shoots five of 17 from three. But, you know, it's even if it wasn't his night from three, someone has to take the shots. Like, and he did it. I, I just think that, unfortunately, he's sort of like the totem for what this offense becomes when you're missing a Jalen Brunson and when you're missing a Julius Randle and you're missing those guys that can create more, you know, and that can, you know, organically like make good shots for their teammates and everything else. I think that Dante is just sort of like, he's not quite able to do that. You know, he doesn't have the the dribble package to break guys down and, you know, get inside all the time. He can attack a shifted D real quick and get to the rim that way. And he did that a few times in this game, although to mixed results, because he's still not a fantastic finisher around the rim, but he can at least get there. Um, but those are only going to come in certain scenarios. And if he gets the ball and the defense is set against him, he's going to default to just shooting threes a lot. And we sort of saw that early. Like he just kept progressively taking his threes from further and further back. And like, they weren't going in from normal range. And so then he just started taking the Curry threes, you know, from like four or five feet behind the line. And it just wasn't working. I mean, his his first quarter especially was particularly tough. I mean, 2 of 11 overall, 1 of 9 from 3 in the first quarter. But you don't fault him for taking them because you know that all it takes for him is to just make a couple. And then sometimes that can turn his whole night around and, and he lights up and, you know, goes on a heater. And, you know, then you're in really good shape to potentially win a game. But this just was not that game. Um but yeah, I think I think he's gonna another thing we've learned, you know, during the stretch, like he's gonna have some nights where he can be a de facto first option, but it, this just wasn't one of them. And I mean, I think that in general he's he's just not that guy, and that's fine. I mean, he's not signed to a superstar contract or something. He's signed to a very affordable contract uh for a long time for the Knicks here. So they've got a steal no matter what. They've got a guy that can score 20 points on mostly spot up threes and stuff like that. It's just you know, it's tough when he has to step in and be this, uh, uh, the alpha here. Um, but yeah, he was getting, he was getting good looks. I just think they didn't go in and, you know, I, 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 I think that's it. You know, that's just, he, you just got to get him good looks. And as long as you do that, most nights he's going to cash in on them. This just wasn't one of those nights. And yet he still managed to soak up the usage and whatever to kind of give some other guys a reprieve and, um, you know, make life easier for his teammates. So, that's about all you could ask in this game. And hopefully next time, you know, the, the shooting comes around a little more. But uh, I still want to talk about Deuce McBride and how he performed in this game. Jericho Sims, another solid outing for him. Like he's he's producing some of the most solid minutes on the team. Bojan Bogdanovic kind of was doing his thing. But with him and Deuce, I, I think there's, there's some stuff left on the vine here. So uh, I want to talk about all that in just a second. But first, this next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. And sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest, big or small. Certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased on your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week. And for a lot of us, maybe you all are thinking about Presh Sachua. Maybe you're being empathetic towards him and, and being like, why isn't he getting more minutes? I don't know. I mean, that's that's the silly sports, uh, you know, thing there. But in a in a more real context, I've been talking about this almost every time on this better help read. But why not? It, it's the most uh, poignant thing I can think of, you know, like as a podcaster, sometimes this is this is tough too. you go through these losses. And, you know, I spent most of today thinking, you know, or tonight and then this morning I'm recording this in the morning thinking about like, 
uh, how do I even approach this game? Like, are people going to care about what I have to say? Are people going to care about this game at all? You know, what it's it's stressful. It leads to anxiety. Um, and, you know, whatever you do for work, there's always going to be things that are going to, you know, push you and make you, you know, uncomfortable or, you know, give you anxiety or whatever. And that happens to me all the time with podcasts because it's it's different than most lines of work and that everything that I'm doing is being viewed by people. And, you know, there's there's a certain amount of anxiety and stress that comes with wanting to entertain and wanting to, you know, wanting to have the stuff that that you do resonate with people. So I definitely uh, have had that come up and I'm sure that that comes up for other people in other lines of work as well. But instead of talking about it on a live read, perhaps I could try therapy and you could as well, because therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team or even your woes as a part time podcast host. And it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. So visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10 percent off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA. All right, and I'm back in to breeze through the rest of this game. I don't know if there's too much more to say. I mean, again, it's pretty pretty easy to just identify. Like, the team didn't play well because they were shorthanded. They didn't shoot well. Everybody ran out of ran out of gas towards the end. It is what it is. I wish they would have won this game. I wish they would play pressure to chew more, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, Deuce McBride, though. Definitely can't fault him for anything in this one or the last two games. I mean, this guy's been a freaking warrior. He, he sat like a total of like two and a half, three minutes over the last two games, which is insane. Uh, so Deuce ended with 11 points, nine assists, four of 15 shooting, shot three of 10 from three in 45 minutes and 38 seconds in this one after playing over 47 minutes in the last game, like 47, 18. So just crazy, crazy two game stretch for him. Uh, and really, man, he's going to need all the all the ice baths he can these next couple of days because I can only imagine the the toll that's taken. Even though he's young, you know that still probably takes a toll on your knees or whatever. I hope for his sake that Shake Milton can get up to speed by next game if Brunson's not able to go because I just think it would be beneficial for Deuce too to just have someone out there to spell him so that then he can come back in and you know provide all the great things that he does on defense and everything and not run the risk of getting too tired, but. Uh, he had his play of the game easily awesome blow by dunk around DeJounte Murray in the third quarter that really, I think, was the spark that sort of pushed the Knicks towards uh, their like uh, they were down, I think, 10 or or 11 or something at that point. And Deuce hit that dunk. And then all of a sudden it was like things jump started and the Knicks were able to make that comeback that ultimately wound up fruitless, but got them, you know, even with the Hawks, which was big after being down 20 plus points and like. Deuce was the guy that that did that with that dunk. I think that that was that was the spark that ignited the fire for everybody. Uh, but I really wish he would utilize his his burst like that more. You know, I find I found myself watching that and being like, why don't we see more of this from Deuce? Like, it, it seems like sometimes, and I mean, I even was watching through uh, some of the highlights of his assists and stuff like that. And you know, when he's tasked with running the offense and being like the the point of attack guy i feel like he is reluctant to use those jets sometimes and is reluctant to get as close as he can to the screen when he's getting around it which is i think what restricts him some because we see you know on a play like that where he drives by murray that he's got the speed to get around someone like murray is not a bad defender period i mean he's pretty good i spent a, this whole season you know trying to talk him up prior to the trade deadline uh about how i thought that he could come to the knicks and potentially give them something really good in that two guard spot um but like i i don't know what it is with deuce like i i just wonder if it's if it's like lack of confidence in his handle like fear of getting stripped kind of thing if he goes too tight around a screen but i feel like if he would attack pick and roll and get right up as close as he can to his screener work his way around then potentially take a bump from the, you know, the guy who's coming over to try to help uh, off the pick and roll there. That could be really beneficial to him. Like, because he's clearly got the speed to get around like a big that would be there. And then from there, the world is his oyster. You know, he can finish because he have the big pulled up already. Uh, he could put someone on his hip, like Emmanuel quickly style. Like that was what quickly was really good at. He would get around the screen really tight 
and then just kind of put his his own defender to try to get under the screen then and then end up behind him. And then that's how you end up in those scenarios where you could sort of stop, start, stop, start, and you know, eventually put up a floater or go all the way for a layup and try to draw a foul. Like whatever it is you want to do, you can do it out of that scenario. And I think Deuce has the ability. I just think maybe he just lacks the confidence at this point. Um, so hopefully he's able to find that confidence because I, I do think that there is something to his his like first step, you know, I think his first step is good. I think he just doesn't quite utilize it the right way. Um, so hopefully he's able to maybe watch that dunk and be like, Oh, I can do that. And, you know, even though I did it by creating a ton of space laterally from Murray and utilizing just that open lane that I created, like I can, you know, possibly do that with a little less space and, you know, take the hit. I mean, he's a former football player. Like, I think I think he understands getting hit and whatever. And I almost wonder if he's maybe worried about being like too strong and potentially, you know, going out of control and, you know, getting offensive fouls called against him or whatever. But take that chance. Give it a shot. Like, I doubt that you're going to run into a big or something down low and have it turn into anything other than free throws for you. So that would be my advice to Deuce. But hopefully he's able to to build on that. Um, Otherwise, he did have the nine assists. You know, a lot of those were just kind of like swinging the ball around the perimeter uh, one or two of them came to Precious as well, which was just kind of like Precious got the ball and then, um, and then you know drove in or whatever. So uh, it, some of the assists were like I don't want to call them cheap, but like they weren't like fully created by Deuce. But all in all, he did a good job moving the ball. So props to him for that too. Um, Jericho Sims had another really solid outing as well. I wanted to highlight him: four points, nine rebounds, six offensive rebounds in 26 minutes. He's just continuing to put out quality minutes for the Knicks when they need him right now during this stretch. And I think he's just sort of the epitome of the Knicks model of like giving bigs a hyper specific job and a a hyper specific function to succeed at. He definitely does that. Uh, He had a really nice putback dunk on a, on a particularly impressive multiple offensive rebound sequence, uh, which I really liked. So props to Sims. I mean, he's not doing anything too flashy. I mean, he didn't have, other than that putback dunk, which was flashy just from an athleticism perspective, he didn't like try, at least unless I missed it, he didn't try anything like new out of the bag of tricks in this game. Like no, uh, uh, you know, two dribble move from the perimeter or whatever, like he pulled off a couple games ago. But if he just stays with doing what he's asked to do, like, again, I, I think ideally he's still the third, fourth, you know, if you consider Precious a center at times, like he's probably the fourth center I would want on this team. Uh, fully healthy, but I think that just kind of speaks to the depth of the center position on this team more so than anything about Sims. Like he's turning into a really serviceable backup big, and you know whether he ends up spending his whole career with the Knicks or if he eventually you know seeks greener pastures to try to find like a true like number two job somewhere. Uh, I, I really like what we're getting out of him right now, and and he's he's honestly proving me wrong because I really. I did not think that he was a rotation player as of earlier this year. I thought that things were just kind of like stalling for him, but I think he's shown a lot of growth since he's been getting more playing time lately. So big props to him. And then uh, Bojan Bogdanovic, the last guy I'll highlight real quick, 19 points, six of 18 shooting shot four of 11 from three in 31 minutes. I mean, he was one of the guys who was getting minutes in lieu of precious getting minutes, which I don't know why they had to be mutually exclusive. I, I thought that, um, yeah, I think they could play really well off of each other because Precious with that driving ability and then Bojan with a thing that's not getting utilized enough, his ability to sort of run offense a little bit and run a pick and roll, you know, use his pace to kind of like get inside probe and then hit bigs for like easy dunks or whatever or kick it out to the perimeter. Like, I don't think the Knicks are really utilizing that at, to the most that they can at this point. And especially in a game like this where you had like, Alec Burks trying to do that. And like Burks didn't have a good game. I don't even feel like highlighting him to be completely honest, but like, you know, you had Burks trying that you had Hart handling the ball, like DiVincenzo, like why not have Bogdanovich run the offense for a little bit? I mean, that gives the other guys on the team, like Josh Hart, an opportunity to cut, which when he's cutting, he's really dangerous. Uh, Give him an opportunity to cut towards the hoop. Give, you know, I think, Honestly, if you're talking about the guy that maybe sets the bigs up the best or that could potentially set the bigs up the best, like Bogdanovich has a really nice uh, set of moves as far as getting inside and then, you know, swinging it around to a a big for a dunk or, you know, kicking it back out to the perimeter. Like, I think he's got a little more in his bag as a creator than the Knicks are really utilizing him for right now. And so I hope that they maybe come around, especially if they're going to be without Brunson for any longer. Um you know, and, and especially with Julius Randle still out and all that stuff, like 
they need more creation. And I think Bogdanovich is better at that than they're giving him credit for right now. And they're essentially just using him as like a shooter and a scorer, which is fine. But I, I think that he could potentially get in a better rhythm, rhythm even if he was uh, setting his teammates up and doing stuff like that. So we'll see if that's something that, I mean, this was one of the first times that we're really seeing Bogdanovich get like big minutes and like crunch minutes here. So maybe Tibbs is starting to trust him a little more overall and feel like he's more integrated. And maybe the next step is getting him some more chances to sort of initiate and whatever. But I guess only time will tell. And uh, the Knicks have a test against the Orlando Magic to put that to the test. And then uh, a couple games against the Sixers coming up next after that. So hopefully a soft landing at that point, depending on how things go with the Magic. But hopefully Jalen Brunson is back next game too, if he's feeling up to it. If he's not, I hope he rests and, and gets better. But until next time, Thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Peace out, everybody.